Well, it's really, really great to um, to see everybody and um, been really looking forward to uh, this evening. And what we wanted to do uh, this evening was to just set out very, very simply in broad brushstrokes, what are we meaning by animism? Um, and for me, actually, this is really, really important because quite a few things I've been reading recently, um, actually under the title of Christian animism, uh, when you actually look at them, then, then they're not animism in the way that I'm understanding it. And so uh, it seems quite a, a, an important opportunity just to set things out. And then we're going to be obviously having a conversation around the whole um, uh, theme together um, when I finish sharing. So that's my plan is just to set out what I see as the uh, main principles of, um, of animism. So that's our question, what is animism? Okay, now the first thing to uh, really make clear is that animism is a European word and it's the only European word uh, to collectively refer to the worldviews and the spiritualities and the life ways of tribal and indigenous peoples around the world. There is no other, um, word in European languages that uh, that does that. When we come to tribal indigenous people themselves, they simply speak about their traditions. They're living according to their traditions. And because of the way the word animism has been misused in the past, some can find it um, sort of offensive. Uh, but there are groups of tribal indigenous people around the world who really working for um, a political voice have taken the word animism up and are using it in a very, very positive way. So you may get quite mixed reactions as far as that's, um, that's concerned. Now, the story of animism really comes in two, in two halves. And there's the original animism, what I'm calling the old animism. And then we'll move into looking at how animism is understood by anthropologists today, which we're gonna be calling the, the new animism. Now, old animism, original animism, starts uh, with a German scientist called George Ernst Stahl, who in 1708 came up with this idea. This was a time when uh, philosophers and scientists were wondering whether there was some kind of, it was known as vitalism. Was there something that made things alive? And uh, George Stahl says, I suggest that there is a physical element which I'll call anima, Latin for breath, that enables all things to live. Now, he didn't shake the world with that observation, but he put it out there. And it was some years later, in 1871, when an Englishman called Edward Tyler, who is seen to be the father of anthropology, um, took this word up. Uh, and used it and made it what it showed off to be as uh, an overarching term to refer to all tribal and indigenous people. So he said, I suggest we speak of animism to describe the beliefs and practices of tribal and indigenous peoples, which are primitive, superstitious, childish, and underdeveloped. So the first point to make is animism from our point of view, gets off to a pretty bad start. And uh, this is caught on, and this belief that animist indigenous people were primitive, superstitious, childish, and underdeveloped influenced colonialists, because at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, sorry, through the 19th century, towards the end of the 19th century, it was a great era of colonialism, and uh, they took it with them, and also missionaries, and their stories, their, their attitudes were formed by this view of animism and their stories that they brought back to Europe confirmed this kind of prejudice that was embedded in, in animism. I can remember missionaries when I was a teenager coming back from Africa and you know, talking in very negative terms about the indigenous cultures of the people they'd been given their lives to work with. And even as a teenager, I don't quite understand uh, what it was, but I just felt 
offended by, by what I heard. And this led to the exploitation and the physical and cultural genocide of tribal and indigenous peoples. And this memory is still very, very strong. And it's also carried in lots of books that still talk about animism today. However, in 1960, something happened which brought about a huge change in the way in which, first of all, the anthropological community and then the wider community of people who are interested started to think about animism. This is the era we call new animism. And the change came about uh, by a paper that was written by an American anthropologist called Irving Hollowell. Hollowell. Um, and for him, um, he lived and spent much of his life living with the Jibwe uh, people in southern Canada. And particularly the way in which they understood personhood struck him um, very forcibly and very powerfully because they viewed persons not just as humans, but in fact, uh, humans as persons were just a subgroup alongside many other more than human persons. If you come across that phrase, more than human persons, that's the phrase that Irving um, Hallowell coined to try and explain the Jibwe understanding. Now, his paper really made people stop and think. Suddenly, astonishingly, for the first time, here we have an anthropologist who's not just observing people and making observations and drawing conclusions, but starting off by listening to them. What were they telling him about their culture and taking that as authoritative and then working forward from there. And so everything began to change as a result of that. We now refer to this as the new animism. Fast forward to 1999, we have an Israeli anthropologist uh, Nurit Bird David, and uh, she wrote a paper reflecting back on Irving Hallowell's um, original paper, and she called her paper Animism Revisited, and she made some very, very strong affirmative uh, responses to what um, Hallowell has said, and also um, drawing on her experience uh, working as an anthropologist in southern India. And she makes this really, really important uh, statement that animism is a relational epistemology. Animism gets its sense of knowledge about things from relationships. She says, cutting down trees into parts is the epitome of Western epistemology, whereas talking with trees is the epitome of animist epistemology. A uh, little story, you know, there's a tree you know, we've seen before. The um, Western scientist comes, chops it down, analyzes it, measures it, counts it, and comes to conclusions where the tribal or indigenous person will embrace it, will spend time watching it, talking with it, listening, and learning as, um, as a consequence. So a totally different approach. And those two voices, Irving um, Hollowell's and uh, Nurit Bird David, along with others, have really set the scene for how animism is understood today. 2005, Graham Harvey, who's now the um, professor of religious studies at the Open University, he's a British pagan animist scholar, once identified as a Christian, but by the time he got to university, um, he decided that uh, pagan animism was what made more sense to him. And in his book on animism, he's given us uh, really the most quoted definition of what anima animism is that I've come across. He says this, animists are people who recognize that the world is full of persons only some of whom are human, and that life is always lived in relationship with others, respectfully, carefully, and constructively towards and among other persons. So he's taken this idea that um, knowledge comes from relationship, 
that relationship is absolutely key and that across everything that exists, we find personhood in many different ways. In 2012, Emma Restall Orr wrote uh, a very interesting book. She's a, a British um, animist uh, author. And she argues in her book that animism is based upon the idea that mind and matter are not distinct and separate substances, but an integrated reality rooted in nature. So these are the ideas that um, we'll be working with as we, as we reflect on animism this evening and hold what I've said in mind because we'll come back and uh, connect with it as we, as we continue forward. Now, when I embraced animism as a Christian animist, um, I needed some way to uh, bring together what I thought were the essential um, elements of animism. And those of you who know me will have uh, come across this list before. And so I set out six principles that I believe will be found amongst tribal indigenous people all around the planet, wherever you go. Now, these principles will be interpreted uniquely within each group, but essentially they are there and will be recognized by every um, animist group in one way or another. And that is that everything is alive, that everything is sacred, that everything is connected, that everything is person, that everything is nurtured and that everything is respected. Now this evening, I'm not going to go into spelling those out in any more detail uh, because we're gonna spend uh, one whole of our um, uh, Christian animist gatherings at a time looking at each of those in the, in the near future. So I'll unpack those then, but just to say these I believe to be the essential principles and characteristics of animism. And um, I work in my writing and reading and thinking and teaching to sort of set those out and be open for them to be challenged. But we'll leave them there. So everything is alive, everything is sacred, everything is connected, everything is person, everything is nurtured, everything is respected. And just a few broad observations following on from that. I've already said this, but you can't emphasize it enough. Animism is first and foremost about relationship. I want to sum it up in one word. That's the word that we use. And I've given a quote here of the animist uh, Ashaninka, people of Peru. The land is for everyone, humans, animals, plants, a reciprocal relationship. And that will be repeated right across the world by tribal indigenous people. Animism is about life. In fact, you could say the clue is in the title because animism, animation, it's all about life being alive. And uh, that is very, very much how um, indigenous people understand the word that everything is alive. And again, I've given a quote here from the, Sa uh, the Sami people, the only European uh, indigenous community up uh, in the European Arctic Circle. Nature is a living entirety. Everything is alive and therefore everything is to be revered. Animism is also about earth. And if we move across to um, the Australian Aboriginal people and a quote from uh, the Australian Rainbow Spirit Elders, are actually a, a group of Christian elders who are also Aboriginal. Uh, they say very clearly, Aboriginal people believe the land is a living entity. It's not something that's just a commodity, it's person, it's living. And in my terms, and we'll come back to this again, I'm sure, um, Earth is both person and community at the same time. But more of that again. Finally, in terms of these broad statements, animism is about spirit. Again, to quote um, a group of Native American scholars from different Native American nations, everything is alive with the spirit of power. 
Now, I just want to make a point here, and that is that reading and listening to Christians who are talking about animism and Christian animism, very often their starting point is with focusing on spirit rather than on relationship. And very often they fail to um, really understand that animism is first and foremost about relationship and they're in danger of getting back to um, the old animism which that you know everything is alive because they're um, inhabited or in empowered by a spirit and that is not um, uh, the way in which we would um, look at animism primarily of course the spirit is important um, the role of the spirit uh, the understanding of spirit and spirits but that's secondary to um, to relationship now so this is something I just feel about very strongly, and that is that the word spirituality in relation to animism, in fact, relationship to a great deal, is used by many, many people, but it's rarely, if ever, defined. And so I've come up with this definition. So when I talk about spirit or spirituality, this is what I am understanding. It needs to be an all-inclusive term. Spirituality is the flow of the experience of the me of meaning and relationship. Now, I like that because it includes people who are atheists, people who are nihilists, as well as people who say very clearly that they believe in God or gods. Um, spirituality is the flow of the experience of meaning and relationship. We can come back to that if you want. Now, in encountering animism, one of the first things that you're challenged by is that you have to start thinking different. Um, the way in which tribal indigenous people understand the world is different to the way in which people who have a Western mindset understand the world, think different. Here's a quote by a very uh, famous Native American scholar who only died a couple of years ago. Uh, Vine Deloria, Lakota uh, scholar and philosopher. The fundamental factor that keeps Indians and non-Indians, or you could say Westerners and indigenous people from communicating is that they are speaking about two entirely different perceptions of the world. That's really important to understand. And in fact, um, one Christian indigenous leader quite recently um, said that um, he wondered whether um, people of the West would ever understand really how Indigenous people think about the world. So, so that's the that's the thing. We can tell there are two minds at work, and I've just set it out very simply here. Um, this is very very um, thumbnail in terms of sending things out, but I think we'll all recognize exactly the tensions that are involved. So I'm referring to original thinking and what I'm calling modern thinking. Now, original thinking is a phrase um, that's applied to tribal and indigenous people's understanding of the world. And its foundations are Aboriginal. Literally, they go right, right back to the beginning. Um, we're told by anthropologists and archaeologists that um, back at least a million years that there, there are remains of um, uh, Homo erectus been found in China and Java that are a million years old at least. And we believe very definitely that originally they came from Africa, so we've got a long story. But also it's global, and this is what is interesting, that right across the world, the tribal indigenous people, you will find a similar style of thinking shared. Now, in contrast, modern thinking is classical. By that, we'll say, well, it goes back to the ancient Greeks. And then we're there with their ideas um, being popularized as Hellenism spread into um, the, uh, the ancient uh, Middle East. Uh, Middle East, uh, and then across West into Rome, and then when Rome came to power, where the Western bit comes in. Also, of course, yes, the Hellenism uh, created an environment in which the, the Christian faith grew up and, and developed. 
Uh, and then we have Rome uh, coming to power, dominating the world. And then, of course, uh, the Christian faith through Constantine um, have been taking a very powerful position and beginning to shape Western thinking and Western culture um, subsequently. And then we go on from there, obviously, into the Renaissance, the Reformation, the rise of science, um, and what has led to modern thinking. Knowledge, well, we've already touched on this. As far as indigenous people, original thinkers are concerned, it's relational and experiential. It comes from a relationship with things and our experience. That is how indigenous people um, know. Whereas in our Western thinking, it's analytical, it's empirical. Then when it comes to meaning, as far as indigenous people, as far as original thinking is concerned, it is spiritual and wisdom based. Wisdom being the practical application of values and information to circumstances that we have to engage with. Now in modern Western thinking, um, meaning comes from a very secular sort of base. Now, of course, it begins to get difficult here because I'm very much a child of modern thinking. And uh, the word secular, when you look it up in the dictionary, means obviously not believing in the divine or the spiritual. Well, I clearly do. I'm sure all of you do as well. Uh, but it's very much focused on the idea of this world. And certainly we live in a culture where the idea that perhaps you might appeal to the spiritual as important. Well, it may be growing, um, but certainly until recently, it was rather frowned on. You, didn't, you wouldn't have done that on television or anything like that. And it's very much evidence-based. And then the perspective, you have this holistic, geocentric, earth-centered um, perspective that is found in original thinking. And then dualistic anthropocentric now, anthropocentric yes in fact you might even say individualistic more than just anthropocentric dualism is is a tricky one um because uh very often you have the idea that it has you know between the natural and a phrase i hate the supernatural um which of course isn't popular modern thinking but there is dualism in we divide things into different groups, you know, right and wrong, light and darkness, day and night, as we see them very much as opposite. Come back to that in a bit. Um, but it has its roots, certainly in Christian thinking, back into um, Gnosticism and um, Neoplatonism, and it's carried over and become part of modern thinking as a result. So that's just very, very simply. Um, some of the base points as far as the contrasting thinking is concerned. Just something for your interest, a little phrase you may have come across or you may come across, takers and leavers. There's a, an author called Daniel Quinn who's written three novels um, in the Ishmael series. Now, Ishmael is a character who's actually a silverback gorilla who is an animist teacher who teaches um, telepathically, fascinating, um, novels. And uh, he divides culture into these two groups, the leavers, they're the original thinkers, the indigenous people, oneness with nature, using only what is essential, leaving the rest, nurturing, spiritual, sustainable in their behavior. Then there's the takers who are representing modern thinking, dominant consumer culture, exploiting, manipulating nature, and so on. And then Ishmael makes a very moving observation. Every time the takers stamp out a lever culture, a wisdom ultimately tested since the birth of humankind disappears from the world beyond recall. Sobering thought. But there's more. Let's think again. A few things that I find thought provoking. And again, I'm back. Uh, quoting Vine Deloria, because he's just very quotable. Western culture is not an adequate representation of reality. That's his statement. And one echoed by many tribal indigenous people. Let me just 
again, just take a few little snapshots here. Let's look at the whole idea of concepts and categories. We've already seen, I'm sure, in a few things I've said already, that animism challenges key Western concepts. The fact that the Jibwe would see um, personhood expressed many, many different ways within their society. Animals, plants, rocks, features of the landscape, rain, snow, um, lightning, and so on. So animism challenges Western concepts. Notice how when we use words like personification or anthropomorphism for inert objects, um, in the Bible, you have, um, you know, trees clapping their hands or mountains dancing. Um, what we're doing is we're taking, we're bending, <clears throat> excuse me, we're bending animist concepts to suit us. We're saying, well, you know, mountains can't dance um, and they can't move either, even though Jesus said they could. Uh, and so we bend things to sort of suit us. And in doing that, we distort their ideas and say they're foolish. And that's something very serious to take a note of. Recognize what I'm trying to say here is, think again, you know, recognize what's going on. When it comes to categories, have you noticed how that in our Western categories, we tend to be very functional and quite inflexible. You know, we put, you know, that animal is a dog, that animal is a cat, or that's a very obvious one, but there are many, we're always categorizing things, but they tend to be put in places where it's either, yes, it is, or no, it isn't. And there's really no flexibility available. Whereas when you listen to animists grouping their understanding of how the world functions, they express their understandings based on relationship and experience. There's that word relationship again. And uh, when, we, when we talk about everything being alive, when we talk about everything being person later on, I'll give you more examples that I haven't got time to, um, to go into now. But there's an important contrast there for us to think about respectfully. And then metaphor in there. Metaphor is vital when we're speaking about relationships and when we're speaking about persons as rocks or trees or clouds. In fact, whenever we're speaking about relationship with persons whose bodies and ways are different from those of ours as humans. And so we'll hear people saying, oh, it's just a metaphor which suggests well, it doesn't, it's meaningless really. But why would that statement have been made that the trees clap their hands, for instance? Um, that is saying something, what is it saying? And just because it doesn't fit into our pattern means we then need to pause and think, okay, what are they saying? What is that telling me about reality that perhaps I as a Westerner have missed? And then myth, we're all familiar with this term. Um, I was brought up with the idea that myth was simply a, a fairy tale. Um, in fact, myth is a unique story form that shares profound ideas far beyond the scope of historic or scientific narrative alone. And um, without it, we simply wouldn't be able to communicate the meaning that reality has in the way that we're able to do. I came across this beautiful definition of myth some time ago, which I just love. Myth has been beautifully described as the equivalent in words of a sacred place. I really like that. The equivalent in words of a sacred place. So moving just the last section, um, I'm calling it free thinking. Indigenous relational epistemology that um, Newitbird David refers to opens up 
a vast horizons of understanding about reality, which we in Western culture are just on the very edge of experiencing. And I want to sort of look at this in a, 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 a kind of conversation that there was in, um, in the United States some years ago. And I want to begin by um, just referring to what I'm calling quantum flow. Everything from quarks, which are the smallest particles that we understand exist, right through to the vastness of the cosmos in its totality. And there is a, there is a dimension of quantum physics, which I, I believe is called um, uh, uh, quantum cosmology. Now, I'm not authority to speak in that, but I certainly see uh, a natural flow from the smallest to the most profound and greatest within, uh, within the cosmos. This raises lots and lots of questions. Well, in 1992, the Fetzer Institute in Michigan, a group of indigenous and Western scholars gathered to explore um, quantum science and compare it with what indigenous cultures knew about their world. And at the end of a number of days that they spent together, this was their list of the things that they believed quantum physics and indigenous understanding of reality had in common, which I find really intriguing. Both believe that everything that exists vibrates. And closely linked to that, everything that exists is in dynamic flux, constantly changing and moving that every part of everything enfolds the whole. Um, not unlike uh, the way in which a hologram, you take one part of a hologram or each part of the hologram has all the detail in it. And that's why it's able to be seen in three dimensions in the way that it is. An implicant order um, of the universe. This is the idea there is a holistic enfolded understanding of reality which holds everything together and gives everything meaning. That the ecosphere, I really like this, the ecosphere is basically friendly. <laughs> uh, also that nature can be taught, that, that I think uh, the word, that, the phrase that came out was new tricks. In other words, nature can learn things that it didn't seem to have before and continue them on without us being involved, which is interesting. I suppose new variants of a virus are one example of that. Quantum potential was seen by many of the native um, scholars as being very similar to their understanding of the spirit. Uh, quantum potential was a phrase coined by David Bohm who was actually at this, um, this, this event. Um, and it's the idea that particles have a sense of direction given to them as they move, which is quite exciting. And then the principle of complementarity, like yin and yang, or um, uh, the, you, you know that light is both a wave and a particle. All of these things, that, you know, they're more than what can actually just be grasped in one given moment. Light and darkness are not opposites, but part of the whole. So these were characteristics and qualities that they um, believed both indigenous uh, people and um, quantum scholars could agree on. But one of the other things that quantum science has thrown up which has been problematic, but indigenous cultures and animism has helped with, been what I'm calling liquid language. Quantum science has shown that um, in the West, we really aren't able to speak about things appropriately, appropriately that we're discovering um, because we simply don't have the words. And that's because European Western languages are primarily noun-based. Whereas certainly across Native American languages and others in the world, um, they are verb-based. Well, here's David Bohm again, the quantum physicist. 
he was so concerned about this. He was an American, but he taught most of his um, academic life in London University. Um, he tried to develop a, a verb-based language, which he called uh, remode, or to flow in the Greek. Uh, but then he discovered indigenous verb-based languages and said that this is what I've been looking for. And there were scholars, Native American scholars at this event that they were at um, who would say, I can go all day without using a noun. Just doesn't, it's not necessary in my vocabulary. So a couple of questions or a couple of observations, you know, what would knowledge be like if it was expressed in verbs rather than locked up in nouns. Just throw that as a teaser. Native American nation, uh, the Mi'kwa'k, uh, named their trees for the sound that the wind makes when it blows through them during the autumn about an hour after sunset. I like the precision of that. <laughs> and so whatever that sound is, that's the name that they've given to those trees. And that kind of thing. Bringing it to um, a biblical focus, I love the fact that the, um, the Hashem, the name of God that was given to Moses in the bush that burned but wasn't consumed, is a form of the verb to be. So it's verbal. I also love the fact that shalom was originally a verb that was then distilled into becoming a consonant. So to conclude, one final point, um, I'm calling it childlike maturity. For me, the role of children in understanding reality is really, really important. And we'll talk a lot more about it, but um, their sense of wonder about the world and their wisdom, you know, the two groups of people in the world who ask the hardest questions are children and philosophers. And children often have the edge. Uh, I just couldn't resist this picture. I thought it was wonderful of a group of indigenous children. But I mention this to conclude um, with some caution for three, well, three reasons. First of all, when we're talking about animism, let's be very, very careful when we do mention children because European colonialists argued that indigenous people were mere children. Remember that um, quote that I gave you um, from Edward Tyler? Um, and they argued that because they were just children, legally they had no rights and therefore Aboriginal lands could be taken by the colonialists. Horrific. So we need to really acknowledge that if we ever talk about children in the context of animism. Secondly, indigenous children are not born animists. Animism is a culture that is learned by experience and taught by elders that develops throughout childhood into maturity. And I haven't got time, but I could love to give you some examples and maybe I will on another occasion. However, as a Christian and as someone who is very committed to Jesus, um, there's also promise, there is a statement. Jesus says, and makes it very clear that there is something unique about childlikeness that challenges the domination system of adults. And that is key to rediscovering his animist path. He says, unless you turn, very strong phrase, unless you turn and become like children, so there's something about childlikeness that is very, very important in engaging with the astonishingly um, profound and complex, powerful vision of animism. So again, if I was to sum up everything I've been trying to say um, in this little piece is think different. So to conclude, please take time to nurture the essence of animism. Let it permeate, permeate and germinate and shape and change you and me. For our Christian animism to be true, it requires that we engage with these foundations in a way that really is authentic. I'll leave that there.
and um, over to you and we can uh, talk and discuss.